1,243 of 1,200 Jewish people, they have fired hundreds and hundreds of rockets on Israeli communities there in the northern part of the country. While I was in Israel recently, I spoke to Major Hale. has grown. It's not just in Lebanon. We're spread all over the place. We call today the Northern Front. It's the Golan Heights Syrian border and the Lebanese border. The Hezbollah Front, I can say that after the trauma of October 7, and most of the towns were evacuated, more than 100,000 Israelis are right now have no other refugees. We have uh, ghost towns. We have empty villages, and every day there's battles there. There's rockets, Hezbollah's shooting, there's missiles they're shooting. And we're not just uh, hitting, of course, we're attacking, we're making them have, pay a very heavy price. But we're more on a defensive mode there because we have a focus on what's happening in Ghana.
children before us, the adults. I'm joined again this week by my executive director, Josh Wood. Josh, welcome to the weekend. Hey guys. We're gonna start off with some Bible time uh, because that's how we like to start everything off. I've been going through Exodus, as you know, if you've been tuning in the last couple weeks, and I stumbled upon this very familiar passage about Moses, burning bush, and the conversation that he has with God about whether or not he is up for the task of what it is, and he's been through the process of like, okay, who are you? Okay, what do you want? And then he gets to the how-to, right? What if they don't listen? And Moses says to God, suppose they don't believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord hasn't appeared to you. Boy, you're crazy. The Lord didn't appear to you. So the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? And Moses said, a rod. So I just thought, this is so true. God seeks to use all of us for these big, world-shaping missions. And very, very often, he does it with what is in our hand right now. I mean, obviously, this happens in the Bible. All throughout, you've got, like, David using what's in his hand to fight Goliath. You've got, you know, Shamgar, who uses, like, an ox goat to, like, destroy his enemies. Um, you've got five loaves and five fishes in the hand of a boy who's used to feed, you know, five thousand. And oftentimes what God does is he says, I am calling you to something great, and I'm going to use what's in your hand. It looks very ordinary. It doesn't look very fancy. It doesn't look like the conventional weapon. But in God's hand, Moses' staff parts the Red Sea is a symbolism of triumph when Israel prevails against their enemies. It's called the rod of God. It's a, it makes water come out of a rock. So this is actually true for you and me too. When God calls you to something great and world-shaping, which he is, because that's what he does for everyone, he is going to do it using the things that are in your hand. What's in your hand? What is it that you're holding right now? I'll, I'll wager a guess that it's probably some of, the great, some of the greatest pains or struggles or challenges that you've gone through in your life. But you give that to God and you put it in his hand and it becomes this incredible weapon over which the enemy cannot overcome. So my encouragement to you today is you're probably thinking about ways where you need to step up and step in to some of the great battles, whether it's just in your family, whether it's in the culture at large, Hopefully it is in some way on behalf of children. And I bet that God wants to use something in your hand, something personal you've gone through to do exactly that. I, I love that, you know, we hear in the New Testament about Moses. He's in there, by the way. They talk about how he tried to do the work he was called to early as well which is what got him sent to the wilderness, is that he almost did it on his own strength, his own timing, out of emotion, and it says they weren't ready to go with him. And now we see later in life, after a time in the wilderness, God's calling him to it and he's much more hesitant. So I do think it speaks to those people too who we've been burned, we've tried and failed, we've crashed out, Maybe people have things on us. They're gonna to point to the, the ways in which we haven't lived up to these ideals in the past. All those kind of words in our ear, uh, why we shouldn't be the one to do this. You know, this isn't just Moses lacking courage. He just knows what happened last time. And so I do think it's, it's really important to remember, not only can God do great things if we allow him submit what's in our hand, but also it's, it's good to remember that this is all gonna be in God's hand. your moment and let God reveal to you, hey, this is the time. Hopefully it's as clear as a burning bush. I can't promise that. But hopefully God does reveal to you the moment and then be confident like he chose Moses through this example that I can make this happen with you, with whatever's in your hand, no matter how big the obstacle. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep, we do need more of us that are ready to step up to the um, major challenges of this moment in history and it's not for the paid activists and it's not for the government officials it's for you and me and everyone with the ordinary things in our hands right now 
We're going to cover some trending news now. There has been a lot going on that intersects with marriage and family, certainly reproductive technologies. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about some of the big headlines that have been in the news this week. Yeah, we've got a, uh, a headline out of PBS. Vance assures media that Trump would veto a federal abortion ban. So before we dive in, let's just all remember where things stand currently. The famous case Roe v. Wade essentially put, uh, gave abortion access to everyone. It was at the federal level which existed above the states and it said essentially that you cannot restrict a woman's right to abortion. Now, over time that kind of became viability, like you could, you had, you had to, if the baby could survive outside the womb, you couldn't perform an abortion then and, and it stayed in the courts forever. There were all these fights. Um, now where it stands, post Dobbs, which was the next decision, is that it rests with the states, which allows for California to have a very different law than, say, Tennessee. So when asked about this, the question was, will we return to a federal mandate, the opposite of Roe? So where Roe mandated access to abortion, this proposed federal abortion ban would say, it is illegal now, it is unconstitutional to provide access to an abortion, no matter if you're in California or Tennessee. So when candidate Vance was asked about that, Vance said, I can absolutely commit to vetoing an abortion ban. Katie, what do you think about that? Well, unfortunately, it looks like a continuation of the slide that we are seeing from a Republican Party and certainly Republican candidates who in the past have been very clear on their pro-life stance. You know, we saw this, um, you know, I really like J.D. Gantz. I think that he's a good guy. I think he's a family man. I think he's incredibly smart and articulate. Um, and in the past, he's been staunchly pro-life, an absolute ally in the fight for the unborn of our country. But he had an interview, um, you know, leading up to his selection as a VP candidate where he said, yeah, I'm okay with the, uh, the abortion bill, which is the majority of abortions that take place in the country today. And then we saw the pro-life provisions stripped from the GOP platform. And you and I talked about this on the radio show. And now we're seeing them move farther and farther away from recognizing the pre-born as having a right to life. I mean, J.D. Vance said this um, this week about vetoing a federal abortion ban, but also President Trump tweeted something about how he wants to protect reproductive rights. Now, I don't know what he means by that, but I'll tell you what, if he means what we think that he means, that means that he is now solidly on the pro-choice side of things. So what do we know? What do we do here? And the answer is, we don't make our determination, you know, as Christians, as conservatives, and certainly as people that stand on behalf of child protection. We don't determine our policies based on political convenience. We don't make those kinds of calculations of, I'm gonna say this so I can win. There's no worth, there's no benefit of winning if it means that the smallest and most vulnerable among us are victimized. I mean, you might make a political calculation there, but it should never be at the expense of the most vulnerable. So this is not a palatable conversation right now, you know, even within the quote-unquote safe camp of conservatives, Republicans, um, some Christians, but it doesn't matter. We don't make decisions based on whether or not we think we're going to win. We make decisions based on what is going to provide the ultimate level of protection for kids. And unfortunately, that means standing against some of what's coming out of the Republican Party right now. Well, I think we would do, so if you are conservative, then you feel compelled to still vote for Trump fans. I do think you'll do yourself a service by at least admitting that this is not a good thing. Like, to, to we have to follow the truth wherever it takes us. And if fertilization begins life, that moment, then that is a life, whether it exists in California, whether it exists in Tennessee, whether it is inside or outside of the womb, life is life regardless of its location. And I don't think that doesn't preclude you from voting for Trump advance in this election. I'm saying that, but we should be able to say, hey, yeah, yeah, I think that was that was against my values, and I might still vote because I believe the alternative is worse. 
worse. But what we can't do is see this decision and then try to somehow justify or change our values and, and put truth in subjection to this thinking political movement. I think then people don't take it seriously as, as Christians. I think we're going to be able to sit back, critique, and go, I think they really got this one wrong. I may still vote for you, but that was not a good thing. I do not agree with that. I will not support that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I want to hit on another major news headline that did not get the kind of coverage that it deserved, uh, certainly from the mainstream media. Um, and that is what's happening to children who have come across the border. Josh, can you tell us a little bit about what was revealed this week um, about the fate of some of these unaccompanied minors? Yeah, I'll give you the summary real quick. So this was in the Federalist. The federal government loses track of up to 300,000 children who illegally cross the border. So the Department of Homeland Security's IG recently released a memo showing that the administration has lost track of potentially up to 300,000 children who illegally crossed the border. 32,000 are unaccounted for uh, after being issued notices to appear in court, and the other 291,000 have yet to be issued these appearances for court, so they're just not sure yet. Yeah. So, translation, we have probably lost maybe up to half of the kids that have come across the border. And, you know, our next segment, the reason why I wanted to hit on this briefly is our next segment, we're going to be interviewing Laura Reese of the Heritage Foundation. She wrote the Board Security and Immigration chapter of our new book, Pro-Child Politics, why every issue is a every cultural economic and national issue is a matter of justice for children and so when i saw these headlines the reality is i wasn't surprised because i had read laura's chapter i had seen she already laid out the way that children are being victimized in the most brutal way um, through our current border security and immigration policies and so this revelation, it almost is like you could have seen it coming. The way that we are processing, the way that we are um, welcoming children to come across without a parent invites this kind of abuse. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. This is, we, we you know, I, I do think to give people credit, I think border policy can sometimes be have, uh the most idealistic of intentions, that we can take everyone, we will welcome everyone, we will help everyone, and this great nation will, will assimilate everyone into, you know, loving families, they'll get jobs and things will go great. And I think, you know, a real point of contention is where are the adults in the room to talk about the realities that we have made commitments to generations of Americans who are already here, who are poor and need help who can occupy a limited number of spots, whether it's in vocational training schools or in you know, housing shelters. And we, if there is one bed and two people, like we gotta remember, one person will not get the resource. We cannot print an unlimited amount of money, nor can we create an unlimited amount of shelters. We have to grapple with realities. And by lying to ourselves, we are creating this situation that we're in right now, where these 300,000 kids will just disappear and they're going to hope it doesn't make the news uh, and, and the, the world doesn't get to see the consequences of our irresponsibility and unwillingness to tell the truth. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this headline brings into sharp reality that children are being victimized through our current immigration and border security policy. And that's why we want you, ordinary mom and dad, regular voter, everyday citizen, to start thinking about what major political issue through the lens of child protection, through the lens of justice for children. Why? Because they are. And this story more than anything else highlights that sickening, horrible fact. So we want you to think rightly about politics. Go grab a copy of Pro-Child Politics today. Get one for yourself, get one for your legislator, and let's start protecting kids.
investors, business leaders, and legislators. Visit thembeforeus.com slash donate today and join us in our campaign to protect kids. Can you be gay and Christian? What if you genuinely feel like you're trapped in the wrong body? Did God make you this way? Is change even possible? Dr. Michael Brown countless people ask these very same questions. Some of them quite desperate. Many of them in tears. Would you be ready to give a godly answer? Each one represents a person or family member with loved one who's struggling deeply with their core identity. Satan wants to deceive and destroy God's truth. So we know that what the scale affirming agenda within the church is doing is it's fragmenting scripture, it's dumbing down the Bible. And infiltrate the church with his lies. In his image clearly and compassionately presents God's truth through Bible teaching, science, and the testimonies of those who know both sides. My dad walked in the door and he said to me, I want to talk with you. And the first words out of his mouth were, I want to become a woman. Get the two DVD set at resources.afa.net resources.afa.net What helps us to grow in holiness? Come to the Holiness Conference this weekend at the Expo Center. Buy seven steps to holiness today at your local Christian retailer. You may be surprised to learn that one of the tools God uses to make us more holy is suffering. In fact, the pathway to holiness always involves some form of suffering. You see, affliction has a way of stripping away the stubborn deposits of selfishness and sin that build up in the course of everyday life. The psalmist put it this way, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Are you going through a time of suffering? Let me encourage you, hard as it may be, to embrace this as a gift from God. Ask Him to use this season to make you more like Him. With Seeking Him, I'm Nancy DeMoss Wagamuth. Did you know Them Before Us has a free small group? Our seven-part video series addresses marriage, divorce, same-sex parenting, IVF, surrogacy, adoption, and more. This study is the perfect way to train believers in your community on why God's design for family is Plan A for child protection. To learn more, visit thembeforeus.com slash small or visit thembeforeus.com slash donate to make a financial gift. Welcome back to Them Before Us on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Katie Faust, founder and president of Them Before Us, a global movement that seeks to put them, the children, before us, the adults, in matters of marriage and family. But as you guys know, if you've been listening the last couple weeks, the other big project that we've had on our plate right now is an effort to take that put children first mindset into all of politics and our next book pro child politics seeks to do exactly that so we have broadened our child protective lens beyond just marriage and family even beyond social issues and we've started to take on and really frame a lot of the economic and the national issues as matters of justice for children as well we worked really hard to get this out before the election because we understand that you guys are making decisions about who to vote for, and a lot of that is going to come down to the big issues that we're facing. And what we're trying to do with pro child politics is to say, all of these issues have something in common, and that is, when we get them wrong, children are victimized. So in this election, it was very important for us to have a chapter on border security and immigration. Other than the economy, it's probably the thing that concerns people the most. And so we invited Laura Reese of the Heritage Foundation to write our chapter on border security and immigration. So Laura is here joining me today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Katie, for having me on and for spearheading this project. Yeah, great. You know, I'm going to, I want to walk people through your chapter here. But first, just give us a little background. Like, how did you get into this? And, and what's your background here in terms of, like, immigration policy? So I have been working on immigration matters for about 28 years. Uh, I fell in love with the, the issue back in college. I just found it fascinating because so many factors affect immigration, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, people migrate for economic reasons, for family reasons, for um, a, a whole host of, of reasons, political reasons. 
uh, but also immigration then affects so many aspects of our lives here, whether it is our economy or our um, you know, education or crime or health care, et cetera. And uh, it's it just because it affects everyday Americans in so many aspects of our daily lives, it's just been at the forefront and you know the, the past three and a half years are just off the charts yeah absolutely um one of the things that i required every author to do is begin their chapter with the real life story of a child who was harmed because we got this issue wrong and it stunned me because as you know the news has been coming out in the last week or so that um, immigration services have actually lost track of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of children who came here unaccompanied and then were supposedly united with relatives, but the reality is we have lost them, they've been trafficked, they're doing forced labor, and that is the story that you tell at the beginning of your chapter. So just give us a recap of what some of these migrant children experience. Yeah, so unfortunately, a law was put in place back in 2008 that entices unaccompanied children to cross the border as such, uh, because it then promises immigration benefits once they are here. And once that law was passed, very predictably, the number of unaccompanied children drastically increased. And under this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, they have hit record numbers. Uh, in the three and a half years, over 521,000 unaccompanied children have crossed the border. And the New York Times, no less, has written a series of articles on the conditions that these children then face, whether it is being sent off to quote-unquote sponsors who are not vetted by the Department of Health and Human Services, so they themselves can be illegal aliens, they can be traffickers, they could have multiple unaccompanied children living with them, inappropriate sex combinations, inappropriate age combinations, and then these too many of these minors are then subjected to sex trafficking and or child labor violations. Um, you know, working early hours, long hours, in dangerous conditions, um, not being able to go to school or missing some school. And it's just, it, it, we passed laws on this over a hundred years ago to protect uh, children from such conditions. And yet this administration and the left seem perfectly fine returning to it. And yet when you call them on it or try to expose it, then of course they blame the greedy corporations, but it's their very policies that entice it. Yeah, exactly. And your chapter does a great job of highlighting um, why our current immigration policies are bad for kids. And you zone in on two different groups of kids. Number one, the migrant kids themselves are being trafficked and victimized and, and abused, but also the overall economic impact um, and safety impact on America's children is also seriously, seriously harmed by this administration's current policies. So let me just read you some of the lies as our listeners know. Um, the template that I requested for all of our contributors was to start with the real life story, but explain the lies about your area of expertise and why those lies harm kids. So your first big lie about immigration is we need more immigration to support the economy. Why is that a lie? Well, the left likes to claim that, well, the, the birth rate is down in the U.S., our public population is decreasing, and therefore we need more immigration. Now, of course, the left pushes abortion. It is their, their idol. Um, and they are not for family. They are not for marriage. So on one hand, they are pushing these very destructive policies to families, to marriage, to children being born, to our population. And yet they use it to justify more people coming here, including children. Uh, in addition, when you are flooding the U.S. with uh, foreign foreigners coming here at working age, 
then you are creating direct competition with American workers, American students, uh, college students, high school students trying to apply to colleges to get jobs right out of colleges, but all the way up to later in people people's careers. There have been plenty of, uh, for example, high-tech, high-skilled uh, American workers reporting how they have been replaced by foreign labor and to add insult to injury had to trade their replacement. Um, so my colleague E.J. Antony, who is a, a labor economist expert, has reported many times that basically we've just swapped out in the past year American labor for foreign labor. So any job increases that there were were for foreign labor, about 1.2, and meanwhile about uh, 1.3 American million Americans have lost jobs. So we're not increasing the pie. It is favoring one population at the expense of Americans. Okay, well, that, that's very clear and I think pretty obvious to the naked eye for any of us who don't exist in ideology land and we really touch grass every now and then. Obviously, that's the case. Your second lie, and this one I think might be the most helpful, it was one of the most helpful to me, is border security and immigration enforcement are racist. Why is that a lie? Well, there's nothing racist about protecting Americans. There's nothing racist about trying to protect the migrants themselves. Uh, during this administration, CBP has reported foreign nationals coming from about 180 countries. What race would that be? There's only 192 countries. So we're talking about the 85% or higher of the globe are coming here. Um, so this is an old tripe that the left uses. They use it to cause division. They use it to deflect, to distract. Uh, but Americans aren't falling for it anymore. It's about the numbers. We're talking about 10.2 million illegal alien, inadmissible alien encounters during this uh, Biden-Harris administration, plus another more than 2 million known gotaways, uh, aliens who purposely evaded border patrol. Uh, so it's just, it's about the numbers. No country can sustain these numbers. And then on top of it, to provide welfare and so many benefits to illegal aliens at the expense of Americans. Yeah, I saw a video of a very cheerful woman talking about how she worked so hard to purchase a new truck for her business and she scrimped and she saved and she, she bartered and she finally got this incredible truck and then she got to the point where she couldn't sustain her business and she had to sell it and she sold it to a migrant who was getting a, you know, government finance loan and didn't have to have any credit and, you know, her toil, this black young business owner, she's like, I toiled. And this guy's getting it handed to him and he's not even here legally. I mean, it was just, it was so bitter. Um, your final lie is that the Biden administration and the Biden-Harris administration has created safe, orderly, and lawful pathways for migrants to come to the United States. Why is that a lie? Well, the numbers of deaths, uh, rapes of the migrants coming here defy the safe part of their lie. It is, is not safe for migrants, nor is it safe for Americans. Uh, the fentanyl that's coming over the border, uh, killing 85,000 Americans each year, fentanyl poisonings, um, along with the crime that is coming. Uh, the, the number of um, convicted criminals that Customs and Border Protection is encountering is either doubling or tripling, uh, depending on the location of where uh, these criminal aliens are coming through. Uh, so certainly not safe. Um, lawful. The Biden administration is continuing to ignore the law, uh, whether it is the Immigration and Nationality Act statute itself, but also separation of powers. So Secretary Mayorkas of uh, Homeland Security is, is completely ignoring the role of Congress to make laws and to determine who gets immigration benefits and who doesn't. And the administrative state under Mayorkas and, and Biden and Harris are just simply handing out immigration benefits and work authorization by themselves in defiance of the law. So it's not lawful. Mm -hmm. And it certainly isn't orderly. I mean, as I spoke, the numbers, 10.2 million in illegal alien encounters, uh, millions more gotaways, that is not orderly. Uh, it isn't orderly for the legal immigrants who have come years before and are still waiting to have their applications adjudicated. It's not orderly for 
uh, families who are trying to bring a family member here lawfully. It's not orderly for employers who are trying to lawfully bring an employee here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, what we required in our chapter breakout, this is we're talking about pro-child politics, why every cultural, economic, and national issue is a matter of justice for children. And we're talking to Laura Reese, who authored our Border Security and Immigration chapter. She's at the Heritage Foundation. She's been doing this, as she said, for about, you know, three decades. Um, woman knows what she's talking about. She's outlined the lies about border security and immigration, but then she also connects the dots between those lies and child victimization, both the victimization of children who are coming here through a very unsecured, un disorderly process, but also the children of our country who then have to suffer with the reduced levels of economic um, success, with less secure um, and less safe neighborhoods as a result, and obviously economic prospects that are going to be dimmed because we are reducing their ability to get their own jobs and maybe forcing their parents out of the workplace. So then we talk about the truths, right? What are the truths about immigration and border security? And your truths are the exact opposite of the lie. I mean, the kind of things that they are saying about border security and immigration is the exact opposite of the truth. So your first truth, I'm just gonna list your truths. I'm gonna let you talk about whichever one you feel like, really, if we really got this right, then we would be able to have a great secure border. So the truths are, unlimited immigration hurts America's economy. You made some of that case already. Truth number two, there's nothing racist about border security or immigration enforcement. Truth number three, the Biden-Harris administration's policies create dangerous, chaotic, and unlawful pathways for aliens to come to the United States. Feel free to talk about those truths and then maybe wrap up with a recommendation of what should we do differently? Like if we could talk to our two candidates to, for president, what would they do if they really wanted to secure our border? Well, let me focus on the unaccompanied alien children and the avenue that they have. Uh, I, I talked earlier about them being... Udo-san. Udo-san. Kyokai de ano... Inori shite ta kedo. いなかったけど、トイレ行ってたの。十分いたよ。最後まで。終わった後、みんなで祈ったんだよ。生産式も出た。出たよ。これ、あの、アカンパニーって、because Either the children themselves or their parents saw this as getting a foothold in the U.S. If I could just get my child across the border unaccompanied, they're going to get to stay. They're going to get immigration benefits. Okaza, okaza, oyaku don tabetai ne, chicken ga aru, iye ni aru desho. Oyaku don dekin no ka ne? Huh? Chicken o matsu reto tokasarate ikenai desho. then that's that's not even the end of it once they get to the u.s then they can be subjected to the trafficking and the child labor violations you know perhaps to pay off their, their... Uh, what are they doing
一応あの沖縄に帰るって言ったの沖縄の言ったわよ知ってんのかね知ってるわけないでしょ知り合いがだけどスーパーバイザーが沖縄の人だっていうのは前から言ってある話題としてああに来週持っていかなくても大丈夫だって言うからさ。いつも持ってきてるんだけどさ、前の日にあのマカロニサラダぐらい作ってきて、言ったわよ奥さんに何か作っても出せますって献金はお母さんはあのし,してんのそれともどうなっていつもしてますって献金ところではしてんのしてないよ献金箱なんかないあま回ってこないの検事たちの教会はみんなオンラインでやってるのあオンラインでやってんのいあの聞かないの献金しなさいっていうやらないのお母さんもしたことないの。現地がまとめてやってるから、私はやってないよ。ああ変わって、変わってるね、それなら。そういうとこも多いでしょ、今は仕事何やってんだろうねどんな知らない行けばいいんじゃないですか聞いたけどちょっと分かんないわなんかオンラインで売ってんでしょ自分もあの見習えばできるかねそれね
28日にほらあの行くでしょ8時にコートコミュニティサービスすることとあとあれもう一つあの30ナイリーデイですねプロベーションしてくれってそしたらお金かかんないから300ドル大きいからね253ドルか252ドルと90銭それにしても高いよねなくていいどこにも I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one.
これ21ヶ月一番安いやつ23ドルくらい新しくできたとこも私が持ってってあげるからいつも。お母さん23ドルも出さなくたってあのあれ外側を洗わなくなったらセブンイレブンで7ドルよいだって1回でしょ毎週やらなくたっていいじゃんだから2週間に1遍か3週間に1遍で22ドルか22ドル約20ドルアンリミテッドだからさただまだあのチケットもらあるからなくなったらさ言うよ。